I'm going to say just a couple things about HILT and our sponsorship of this event and what it is that we're trying to do with, um, with this, which is among many uh, speaking and convening events that HILT does. Um, my name is Erin Driver Lynn. I uh, direct HILT. HILT, the Harvard Initiative for Learning and Teaching, is not a teaching and learning center. We actually have six maybe five to seven, it's hard to count the number of teaching and learning centers at Harvard. What HILT does is bring together those centers. Uh, we also provide internal grants about uh, improving teaching and learning. And we do a number of different events and ways of convening faculty and, uh, and students around improving teaching and learning. This is one such convening. We do a big annual HILT conference. Um, but we have a speaker series that is once every semester, and this is this semester's. We, um, we think of this speaker series as bringing scholars who are doing something that has implications for improving teaching and learning for our community to talk about what they're doing and those implications. We've had two different kinds of events in our speaker series. Some of those are people who are directly doing research related to teaching and learning. So we had a memory researcher from UCLA. We had uh, a human um, uh, computer interaction person from Carnegie Mellon. We had someone who does work on multimedia. And then we have a whole other set of speaker series, um, uh, of which this is a, a type, which is scholars who do work in one area or another, and then who do something to improve teaching and learning as sort of a, a side project that might become more than just a side project, and, and have things to teach our community that they could take into other domains. Um, so we had uh, uh, Steve Pinker who talked about teaching writing. You know, that's not exactly his scholarly work, but he's done some, some work in that area. We had a aeronautic engineer from MIT um, who's doing work on curriculum mapping. So um, when did I first hear about pretext? I was trying to figure it out. Uh, it was at a cocktail party, of course, right? <laughs> um, and, and the idea that really stuck with me with pretext is this, this example of transfer, transferring the authority of learning so we have this stereotype in mind about uh, instructors being able to teach great works. They're the experts. They're sort of unlocking the keys for novices, or unlocking the, the doors for novices with keys that, that are carefully brought um, through years of disciplinary training. And instead, we can think about owning great works of literature by doing things with them, by creating, by, uh, and kind of giving that sense of authority over to, to students. I think this is a very important idea and concept. I think this is an incredibly interesting methodology. Um, and I think it's very timely for the way that teaching and learning is changing. And my goal for today, and I hope that some of you in this room are not in the arts and humanities. I can see at least a couple of you who come from other fields. Um, because the, the, what I think is interesting is to stretch this idea. How far can you take this idea of moving the authority um, using this method as a, a teaching tool? So um, with that, uh, I'll quickly say that we're going to hear from Doris first, with then hear from Gigi. Um, and then from other colleagues, Vivian and Adriana. Um, Doris is a professor in Romance Languages and in African and African, Amer African American Studies, um, and the director of the, tell me the name, the Cultural, Cultural Agents. Um, we have uh, her very esteemed uh, colleagues who teach in Romance Languages who have experience in different applications of pretexts in different contexts. And Gigi is a professor at the Ed School who's going to talk about some of the evidence behind the goals for pretexts and who I understand is helping to collect data and that maybe at some point we'll understand exactly what happens as a result of, of pretexts. So thank you very much for being our speaker, set of speakers for this in our, in our series. 
Thank you so much. Yeah, I got, I have this. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Erin. I'm really delighted, delighted with uh, the, the invitation, with the opportunity to talk to you. Uh, I know there are people from other fields because we're already working with um, Antonio Copete, who is uh, an astrophysicist and who sets up science clubs all over Colombia. Uh, and with whom we're going to be collaborating for a holistic educational intervention uh, this summer. And uh, Dr. Mercedes Becerra from the, uh, the Harvard Medical School, with whom we're going to be working uh, just north of Lima on a, uh, a challenging project to develop ways in which TV, TB uh, treatments will be much more effective uh, with uh, an arts-based education. So th those are just uh, two more colleagues that I hope uh, you know we'll, we'll hear from uh, in, uh, in the near future about these collaborations. I want to say very little because we have uh, three wonderful practitioners and researchers on pretext, and my greatest pleasure is that um, I don't have to speak. <laughs> you know, we learned from great artists like Augusto Boal and Paulo Freire that the work of a teacher is to facilitate, not to speak. So uh, I'm going to say very briefly that what we can offer to our colleagues and students, Christoph, nice to see you. Thank you for being here. Um, uh, what we can offer to uh, students and colleagues uh, at Harvard is a practice that takes seriously what we've learned from great uh, reformers in education, including Freire and John Dewey. Um, we, we were just in Chicago with my new colleague, Wendy Sternberg, who is uh, the director of a, of a wonderful initiative called Genesis at the Crossroads, which is arts education for conflict resolution. And we were just in Chicago. There's still a, an important lab school that Dewey founded at the University of Chicago. And it becomes um, a wonderful oasis for good education, but it's now an elite oasis. What we can do, basing ourselves on their instruction and on popular practices, popular in Latin American Spanish means poor, poor people's practices, we can make very high level education with very low resourced uh, circumstances. So today, by coincidence, or maybe providence, we did a mini workshop in pretext in our cultural agents course, right? And what were we playing with and having, you know, riotous fun with uh, were the first two letters of Friedrich Schiller's Letters on the Aesthetic Education of Man. Try to read that by yourself. <laughs> It's not easy, but when you <coughs> submit it to games, to interpretation, to, um, to collaboration, to just uh, using popular practices, and th this is one. Uh, in the northeast of Brazil, where there's no money to publish, people don't stop publishing. They put up a clothesline wherever, in the, in the middle of a, of, a, of a public square, in front of a building. This used to be true all over the, the Iberian Peninsula, but it's not used anymore, as far as I know, except for the northeast of Brazil. Literatura de Cordel. So everyone wrote a speculation on some difficult problem in Schiller and published it. And you're welcome to come you know, see the, the selection. But, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to say that we, we played with this. We turned literary figures into human figures that everybody then had to read in the text identifying the text, there are millions of activities that we can multiply with pretexts, uh, and we do. So uh, I will just sit down and listen now, and thank you again so much for being here, and I hope allowing yourselves to be recruited for a mo uh, an ever more urgent mission, which is to teach broad bases of poor people how to enjoy uh, difficult texts, not to, not to leave them behind in the lettered city, uh, and just own them, because they become raw material for your own use. Um, so please be in touch with us. Um, 
I'm easy to uh, find in Romance languages, and uh, I invite Gigi to, to take over. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Gigi Lok, as Aaron nicely introduced. I'm an associate professor at the School of Education. And I'll tell you a little bit what I do, and then you start to ask questions like, why am I here to talk about pretext? Uh, I study bilingualism, and I study it from a psychology perspective. I use behavioral methods, use giving children assessment, and sometimes I also use neuroscientific methods. So I study the brain when they're in the MRI machine. So I study, basically, how language experience changes the way we process information, how we learn, and ultimately how we control our behavior through the brain. And so I prepared a small presentation here to share with you today. It's called The Art and Science of Pretext. Um, as a researcher, I'm obsessed with numbers. I know that goes quite against with art, but um, I do enjoy arts as well. So that's why I uh, titled this talk as the, uh, the Art and Science of Pretext. And uh, my collaboration with Doris uh, began last year and over coffee. It seems like pretext is always around food. Um, so we had a really great conversation. And then she told me about pretext. And then I thought, oh, OK, if pretext doesn't rely on the usual method of reading, which has the assumption that everybody can read, then maybe we can actually think about uh, whether pretext is an appropriate method for uh, individuals who are learning to read in a second language. Okay, so uh, my reflection on pretext is that it's driven by these circular uh, missions, visions, and goal. First, uh, the mission of pretext is to fuel learning, innovation, and citizenship through art. And to do this, you not only need language and your reading ability, but you need your hands and your eyes and all the other senses that allows you to learn. So not only through the developing language as a second language learners. And the vision of Pretech is to provide training workshops for local facilitators. It could be teachers. It could be administrators. It could be someone who are familiar with the text that we want the uh, target constituents to know and to achieve such mission. And these two cycles are all um, supported by the goal to empower educators and students at the same time in the teaching and learning of academic text. Academic texts are complex. It's not, some, it's not something that we, can, we were born to read. It's something that we learn how to read. And through that learning process, we don't always have to go with the tools that um, we assume everybody has. We can go with other tools, such as our other senses. And, to strengthen the uh, learning of academic tests, we can enhance collaborative learning. So not only the instructor or the facilitator, um, it's giving out instructions or information to the students. Students are actually giving information to each other as well. So that type of collaborative learning is actually very important when language is not um, fully developed, especially in students who may be developing such language. And in a way, the learning experience is collective. It's not only based on an individual learner and his or her interaction with the facilitator and the instructor. It's actually learning as a community. So that's my reflection as a psychologist to uh, think about what pretext can contribute. And as you can tell, I love graphs. Uh, so the wheels, the wheels and um, the nuts and bolts of the conceptual framework of pretext can be think of like this. Now, if we're developing a language um, and we're developing literacy in a language that we're also learning, it is very hard to just sit down and read a text that we're not familiar with. And so we start with spoken language. And with the spoken language, we also coupled it with arts activity that it's more than just the knowledge of the text and the language, uh, the information that is embedded in the spoken language in order to understand a text. So not only we rely on language as a stepping stone to learn how to read text, but also relying on other senses that give us more context and interaction. 
So I'll give you a very brief overview of how this pretext works. So now I hope uh, by now you're hooked into wanting to know more about what pretext entails. Um, and I have uh, some basic information here, but you're more than welcome to ask questions after this presentation. So the pretext training has a five-day session of three hours each. So that's an ideal situation. But a lot of the times you may think, OK, teachers and administrators are extremely busy in our public school system. How do we do that? Um, so we can also do the training in a more flexible way, uh, such as happening in the afternoon or evenings. Um, I think occasionally Doris have also done it on the weekends as well. And it usually involves 15 to 25 <laughs> participants. Um, the training workshop that I participated in has about uh, 30. It was a lot. It was a very uh, festive um, session. And I have never learned so much with so much festivity going on around me. Um, and it also involves uh, capacity builders. So there you can think of them as uh, instructors, but they're not really instructing. So usually two to three. Um, uh, for the basic activities and then participants also interacting with each other. And the participant propose and leads in uh, different days. So the first day it has the facilitator capacity builder uh, contributing more towards the information giving and then afterwards it's more about uh, individuals leading because that's how you can bring pretext to your local uh, community. And the big theme is to interpret text through art. And the art activity is actually quite flexible. It depends on the community, and it, but it must be culturally responsive. So uh, from what I learned from Doris, I know she has done a uh, Vietnamese opera in Vietnamese using little prints. Um, so I'll, I'll let you imagine how that would look like, but it is certainly a lot of fun. And as you can imagine, it's also certainly make an impression on those who would otherwise not familiar with uh, Little Prince, and now they can remember, they can remember the text, and they know the context and the story behind it. And so after the training workshop, all these participants will bring pretext to their local environment, to their local community, and one or two waivers, uh, weavers will come in to be facilitators. So they will act as, you can think of them as hotline support, to answer questions that you may have and to give you ideas how to um, bring pretext uh, into the community. And the support for the new facilitator um, include uh, per semester, so it could be weekly meetings, weekly visits, and also monthly family nights. So the idea is that we start off with the training workshop. The training workshop will bring all these participants in, and each of these participants will go back to their local community and become facilitators. And the facilitators will teach other people, and the audience will then bring up its a community. So you can see it's a pyramid shape that we actually transfer learning um, from a small group of people to uh, a broader audience. And so the current project that Doris and I are working with is with a local school district where we have a high school student who are learning English as a second language. And they may have interrupted uh, education experience and who also demonstrate a lack of prior literacy engagement. So uh, the, uh, the students, uh, according to what I learned from the district, is that they have um, lower academic uh, achievement and they also have lower motivation to learn because everything is going on in a language that they're not familiar with. And learning in a school itself, it's an experience that they're not familiar with. So participating in arts activity that are designed for and evolved around the targeted text that the teachers will teach will help them to be icebreakers and get into the learning mode from a non-traditional method. And the idea is to promote learning through social interactions and engagement, and in turn, increase the engagement of citizenship uh, in these students who are otherwise uh, feel very alienated from the typical school experience. And Pretext has been quite international. Um, Doris has been going to all these places, including uh, in March this year, she was in Bahamas. And it's definitely a place that I really want to be right now. <laughs> And next, I'm going to have um, Adri Ariana to uh, talk about this very beautiful graph. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Um, okay, so one of the things that we do, we also use pretext as a technique here for the language classes. Um, I teach Spanish and uh, Viviane teaches Portuguese, but we've done it also as part of the training for the TFs and the TAs who are going to be in charge of the section. So um, according to the uh, the um, ACTFEL guide is the, the American Council for Teachers for Foreign Languages, is that when we teach language, we are not only teaching the language, we really are teaching uh, several, five skills that they have identified there, the communication, cultures, connections, comparisons, and communities. So we try to bring a holistic approach to teaching and we address it in the in in listening comprehension, writing, speaking, and um, uh, reading, of course. So pretexts, um, the TAs and the TFs are encouraged to attend some of the workshops, but then they bring it to their own classroom, and they are not really uh, as pretext facilitators. They are not instructed to do. Um, specific activities, but they have to come up with the activities themselves. Part of the, uh, of the beauty of pretext is that you can adapt it to any situation. So uh, you can have very specific goals, like what Gigi just said about the bilingual high schoolers uh, who are not traditional learners, but you can also adapt it to a group of very high achievers like the Harvard students. And, um, but in the language classes, we have some of the same issues. Um, students uh, lose interest when texts are very difficult. <clears throat> Being in the, in the target language, it increases the difficulty. And, um, and we've noticed increasingly that students have lost the capacity to concentrate and to read difficult things. So, um, pretext is perfect because then we can bring the canonical texts to the classroom and um, because we don't have the luxury of the five sessions in three hours, but we do have the luxury of meeting them for a semester three or four, three or four times a week, two or three or four times a week. So. Um, during the pretext activities, we, use, we are using the three modes of communication through negotiation of meaning in spoken and written communication. Um, we enhance oral comprehension. And of course, we are interpreting texts. And uh, while they work in groups, they are negotiating meaning, talking to their partners, narrating the topics of the, of the text and making it meaningful to themselves. Because some of the activities of pretext are really designed so that students can own the text for their own, um, for, for their own lives. And um, I, was, I was watching Doris's class, and this, this was a very good example. So they are reading Schiller, who is not a, an easy <laughs> uh, read. Uh, and, if you read, and I really invite you uh, to read the comments and the questions and the issues that the students bring up, they're all connected in some way to the election, to the recent political events. So what a best way to, you, don't, you are not telling students you have to read Schiller to understand the present circumstances of our nation, but you are really making them or inviting them to read with eyes that are focused or interest in, in what they are interested in right now. And this is a perfect way to allow them to make questions to the text, to respond to one another, to, to sort out difficult concepts, um, intellectual and linguistic and grammatical sometimes, um, 
in partners, in groups, and then to share them with a large group. So again, to go back to, to Gigi, uh, to what Gigi was saying, uh, learning is a communal effort. Uh, we all learn from each other, but we also learn uh, with a second language that we are very tolerant to other people's efforts to, to, to speak the language, that we all take turns. So it also fosters a community of tolerance and flexibility in the, in the language classroom. And Viviane is going to talk about the anxieties in the language classroom. So uh, this is, I, I gave you the ideal picture. Viviane is going to give you the problems. <laughs> Uh, hey, can you hear me? Yep. Good. Uh, so uh, ideally, we would use the target language in the classroom to uh, achieve those goals that are put forth by ACTFO. Um, before getting to the department, I have been investigating for a number of years the impact of language anxiety in language, in, in language acquisition. So um, for the whole time, I have been trying to understand what stops students from participating in class, what stops students from speaking the language, what are the conditions that can really disrupt language acquisition. Uh, so as a linguist, I was, as you just say, said, I was always interested in collecting a bunch of data, have a very significant sample, a large sample, and measure uh, language anxiety in different situations, in different tasks. Right? So I did develop all this research. I had an idea on how the language anxiety affects students, but I did not come up with any idea of how to help students in the classroom to lessen and to feel more comfortable to speak the language. So what I have here to show you um, before I actually show you this, I will show you what students say. And let's pray that it will play. <laughs> I don't understand what this is saying to me. I have been so interested because everyone in my class don't understand my language, and I have a little bit of love. Yeah, I have a um, Mac and PC <laughs> problem sometimes. But uh, basically what students narrate is their apprehension when they are in the classroom. And the source of anxiety is, um, are related to the fear of negative evaluation, communication apprehension, unrealistic self-efficacy, low linguistic self-esteem, mixed classroom, dry lectures, and teaching-centered methodology. So and when I was faced with all these results, I um, was trying to find ways of, of designing my lessons to help students to feel a little more comfortable. Um, with pretexts, what I found is, there we go. Here I have what one student said. I start to get anxious on my way driving here. On my way here, I start I start feeling sick to my stomach because there is a level of nervousness in my other classes, but I find that in Portuguese it is to the point that I feel paralyzed. So this is somehow what they, they narrate. So what I found is, oops, there we go. Uh, with pretext, we can, well, the main source of anxiety is the students are in the mixed classroom and they keep comparing themselves with others, so they feel intimidated. With pretext, we don't really have the students in the center. We don't point out to them and ask them to participate. They are not singled out. So what we do, the main thing is that when we ask the students to speak in the class, what happens is that students will feel uncomfortable at this start to compare themselves with other students. With pretext, everyone needs to speak. So, and we don't ask the students, what did you do this weekend? What, what did you learn this weekend? What did you learn today? We ask the students, what did we do in class? So everyone needs to speak, everyone needs to participate, and by having the students all participating and moving around, 
I, I learned that they feel much more comfortable and they use the language much easier. And also because they have the chance of leading. They bring uh, information outside of the classroom, they bring to the classroom and they all share. So that really facilitated. Another um, learning experience was to notice that students have to do oral exams. So with oral exams, they read that syllabus in the beginning of the semester. They know they're going to be tested uh, at the end of the semester. And what happens is that they, they have an idea of what oral exam is. But with the pretext, they are basically having oral tests and oral exams pretty much every day because they get to speak in class every day. They get to present the work, share the work, and they don't get as nervous because they, that becomes a part of the class. So they participate actively. And with um, the reading, which is very interesting what uh, Adriana was saying about reading difficult texts. I mean, not only reading difficult texts, but reading in a target language itself. If they are reading to themselves at home, if they're just preparing, doing their homework, it's fine. But once they have to speak about what they read, once they have to actually share the thoughts about the reading is when it gets really complicated for them. So with the pretext, because we walk for so long around one text, the students get to listen to the text, they get to practice with the text, make arts with it, they get involved with it, they get comfortable with the vocabulary, therefore they achieve the comprehension that seems to be much more difficult after one simple pre-reading activity, go home, read this, come back, and let's discuss it. So I found that it progressively becomes, students become less anxious. With the writing, what we do, uh, usually we have a, a, a proposal, we have a topic and we ask the students to write about that topic. We discuss in the class, but after using the pretext, the students engage more and more in collaborative activities and a lot of activities with peer review. So they, in the beginning, it's, it seems a little more complicated with the structure of the class, but after a couple of weeks, the students really get used to the situation and things get, like they actually question if you don't do it, and they get used to it. So uh, they can assess the progress. So this is one important thing with language anxiety, it happens most of the time because the students don't have a very clear view of the self-perceived competence. So they don't really know what they know. There's a discrepancy between what they know and what they think they know. With pretext, we get to assess the students often. So every day we're talking about what we did, not what we learned. So with that, students build confidence, therefore they feel less anxious in class. That's what I have experienced. And with exams, because they're constantly guided to do the self evaluation with the exams they are more confident therefore they perform better so um, as Gigi was saying too I love data <laughs> so I didn't bring to you any data with statistics or anything we have been developing the pre taking pretext to Brazil we have been collecting data here as well I'll be happy to tell you more about the methods that I've used and about the data um, and that's what I have for you. I'm sorry that I could not play the audio. And uh, if you have any questions, I will be more than happy to respond. Thank you. Yes, Crystal. Could you actually describe our uh, recent pretext experience? This was a mix of abstract and few concrete bits, but they still do not understand what. Okay. Yes. Yes. I. You know. Uh, thank you. I did not plant this question, but I wanted to tell you, uh, the pretext uh, starts by. Uh, getting people to make cardboard books. Do we, do we have a, the picture of yep. the cartonera? Oh, oh yes. we, have, we have some we beautiful have, we books. We have some beautiful books, yeah. Okay, all over Latin America, people 
use um, recycled cardboard to make high-level books. Okay, you can, you can have your own elite library by recycling garbage and, um, and downloading, downloading material. Okay, this, this uh, started as a popular practice with the economic crisis in, um, in Argentina uh, at the end of 2001. A poet and a painter opened up a storefront and started buying garbage. And the garbage pickers became part of the, uh, the publishing activity. All right? So we start by modeling that. There are, there are now, uh, it, they're just, you know, uh, and we also have a couple of, uh, a couple of houses in, um, in Africa, one in Mozambique and one in Kenya. Um, and so we start a workshop, a training workshop, or a classroom workshop by making books out of recycled material while somebody is reading the text out loud. So making cardboard books is one popular practice. Reading the text out loud while people are making things with their hands. People who've, who've played with us know where this comes from. Does anybody else know? Tobacco rollers spent their lives listening to readers. Tobacco rollers were good artisans who didn't want to waste their time while they were making silently uh, very valuable artifacts out of, out of leaves. They were listening to a reader whom they paid collectively every week to read texts that they wanted to hear. So if you want to know why Romeo and Juliet is still a popular cigar brand, it's because they love huh? and Monte Cristo. They loved Shakespeare. They loved Jules Verne. They loved, you know, Dumas. They loved a lot of uh, famous writers, and they loved philosophers and historians. They were reading in tobacco factories Karl Marx and, and Friedrich Engels because you couldn't fire a reader. And, and imagine that the rollers were going to continue to work. They had enormous negotiating power. And the, the history of organized labor in the United States, too, not just in the Caribbean, starts with tobacco factories. Samuel Gompers was a roller. You know, we, don't, we don't teach that to students. So we start modeling those two popular practices, making books, reading out loud, and colleagues mentioned the, the reading out loud, and after you hear a text, you ask the text a question, just the way any kid knows how to ask a question, and any researcher. Ask the text a question. And if you didn't hear everything that you wanted to hear in the oral reading, we say, do you want a copy of the text? And my favorite moment in pretext, and I just experienced that for the first time, my favorite moment in pretext is when you say, anybody want a copy of the text? And slowly, everybody starts raising their hand. One person, then another, and everybody wants a copy of the text. Show me a classroom where everybody wants a copy of the first two letters of Schiller's letters on the aesthetic education of man. Everybody wants it, because you have to ask your question. It's going to be out loud. You want to look good. And you read that text like nobody. All right? Then you write a speculation on the questions that you heard. They're, they're all good questions. and. Like Adriana, I invite you, you know, to look at some of these speculations. They're all really brilliant. Uh, and then we start playing. You, you saw in the, in the Bahamas video some of the games. You know, uh, find a rhetorical figure in the text and make a human figure out of it. And then everybody else has to identify the figure in the text. How much close reading do you do, especially when you don't get it right? And people laugh, and they guess again, and they look again, and you read that text a million times because you don't want to give up. That's the way it starts. And then we say, what would you like to facilitate tomorrow with this text? And you say, OK, I have a design project I want to do. Let's design you know, uh, a submarine. We need to design a submarine, and we'll use the text for figures and questions that will help us design the submarine. It doesn't matter. You know, we don't look for 
activities that will match the text. We want them to mismatch so that we have to think hard. And, and, um, and uh, I, th I think it was uh, Adriana who brought up the other activity that's standard, and that is going off on a tangent. Do you remember your teachers telling you not to go off on tangents? Huh? Don't go off on tangents. And then they want to know why we're not curious, <laughs> why we don't have to do research. <laughs> so we tell everybody, go off on tangents. Bring something tomorrow that you think has something to do with the text. Well, what I think has something to do with the text may not make any sense to you. But when you ask me about it after I publish it, I get a chance to talk about what I'm interested in. So today, for example, we played with a guillotine. Guillotine is not at all in, printed in, this, in these first two letters. But I know that Schiller sat down to write these letters when he found out that the, uh, uh, the Jacobins just cut off uh, the king's head. Right. right. So I want to know more about guillotines. So I have this bloody picture and a lot of text. And everybody wants to know why I'm so obsessed with guillotines. And then I get to talk about it. And then you want to talk about um, you know, chemistry, because he has this lovely metaphor here about the, um, the philosopher being like a chemist. You know? The philosopher wants to know about art, but by the time he's finished picking it apart, you know, like a chemist does, it's dead. <laughs> you know? So you can, you know, everybody goes off on their own tangent, and then we tell each other why. So that's just to give you an idea of how how this rolls out. And the activities, again, it's the text that will also guide you to the activities, the, the text and the community of learners. So um, you don't have a pre, I mean, you have, you have models of activities, but you don't have guided activities. And um, you can remember maybe in your, in your literature classes, in your foreign language classes, how teachers would give you, comp quest you know, comprehension questions about the text. And you know, everybody has to learn how to answer in a cookie cutter kind of way, and nobody likes it, and nobody really gets the questions or the point of the questions. So we I ask students, well, you can ask the text whatever you want. And that, to me, <laughs> was a revelation as a teacher. What I thought they wanted to know was not what they wanted to know. And just having that moment, is, it, it really leads you to, what, to, to their interests, to their creativity. To, it's an open window to their minds in a way in which class discussion never is. So just by, by having them make that question and, and guiding them, like, you know, if somebody's interested in submarines, uh, why did this text inspire you to go there? Or how can it help you think um, to design submarines, to think of submarines, and, or guillotines, or <laughs> chemistry, or mathematical models, or poetry? You can turn philosophy into poetry. So it's really multidisciplinary in that very, very open way. So once you start creating activities, th those activities will lead you to other activities. And we go back to the same text. So by the end of the sessions or, or the time in which you are devoted to the text, they've read, like Doris said, the text, they have read it a million times. They know every single metaphor. They know um, the rhetorical figures. They know the grammar. They know the topics. They know the characters. <clears throat> in a way in which you could never tell them to read the same text 20 times over and memorize it, and then think critically about it. Oh, I just wanted to add that from the perspective of the instructor, if you have to correct 20 papers with all having the cookie cutter answer, oh. it becomes quite boring. Yeah. Um, this way you have diversity in the responses and you get to know your students yeah. very well. So that when it comes to maybe writing a letter of recommendation for that student or just the assessment at the end 
of the term, you can really personalize the kind of evaluation you're going to give that student at the end of the course. Right. Oh, and it, it's really amazing what you learn about students. You think someone who doesn't speak much in class, who is kind of reserved, you don't know what kind of assumptions to make about, and then that person is a poet. Or, uh, or, or a physicist, and then they amaze you with this. And uh, it, this is not a joke. It's the first time that I, I look forward to reading their <laughs> compositions because I really enjoy them. They are, they are done with interest, with love, with curiosity. And, uh, and like Elvira says, you avoid the, the boring <laughs> responses that nobody wants to write or nobody wants to read. Well, it's already predicted as well. Exactly. Right. There's no creativity at all. Right. Yeah, I had a I had a question, which is, it seems so playful and joyous. How are you measuring that? Like, how do you think through that as your data gathering? And also, um, one of the C's I don't think was creativity, and yet that's a huge outcome of what you're getting, where you can the tangential work um, is so brilliant in terms of drawing in other disciplines and thinking through how do we map on ways of thinking to other, uh, other areas that we wouldn't have ever connected. So you had the connection piece. Um, so how do you measure the creativity and the joy? Those were my two questions. Ah. <laughs> so, um, which is a very difficult question, <laughs> but I will explain to you, I'll give you an idea of what I do in class. So this semester I'm teaching a very advanced course uh, Portuguese for Business, which is a course that I thought that the text would be very dry, and when I was designing it, I said, hmm, with the small group and the dynamics. So um, it's interesting that you can, in my case, I do the assessment in different forms, but I, I also rely on the student's uh, self-assessment. Um, so. What usually students do the reading, for instance, if the students do the reading at home, that we are discussing something related to, let's say, the, the Brazilian coffee industry. Yeah? Then when we get in class, we will do, um, we did a poem on the Brazilian slavery. We're looking, looking at the slavery. Students will listen to that, and the, one of the activities we do, we do the drawing. So they draw while they are listening to the poem. Yeah? And then they hang the poems, like the, the drawing like this. And students all come to in front, and they will be talking about what they had drawn. Usually, um, after this type of activity, we students are prepared to write about what they read, but also to assess. I like to have the colleagues doing the, the evaluation, so they do like peer assessment. Yeah. So I, it's a combination of my assessment of how much of, because uh, we're talking about tangent. So they are uh, um, invited to go off a tangent, but we need to make sure that the students are bring to class also things that will help them to achieve their goals, their learning goals. So um, with the combination of my, assess, my assessment, peer assessment, and their self-assessment, that's how we uh, look at how they had achieved the goal. Um, for this particular class, we, we don't have tests, we don't have exams. It's mostly essays, and they do recordings of videos and podcasts. Um, so I think it's, it's a joy to see that even though we had not read very, per se, scientific and very uh, boring tests with lots of numbers, the students are really, um, really engaged with the class and they can really tell you about the history of some industries in Brazil. Although we had not gone through you know, very um, heavy, I would say, theor theoretical texts. And I, what I do for assessment is sometimes the creativity uh, piece does not exclude a skill or a technical part. So they have to use the conditional. They have to use the subjunctive. So that allows, uh, allows them to do whatever they want to do, but within there's a certain constraint of the skill that they are uh, expected to eventually master. 
and usually that poses no problem. They can they can include it with uh, and that's that's an easy way to assess. I tell them always that I give them two grades, one for level, like the athletes and the performers in the arts, one for level and one for performance. And that that goes um, that goes well. The other piece of assessment that we can have is in a class where I have exams on readings, students have to create their own exam questions and respond them. And that usually, uh, initially, they, they really, they, they have a really hard time making the questions because they say, oh, but how am I? And, and then they realize that when you can make an elaborate question, it's easier to respond. And it usually, it usually goes very, and then I correct them so that they'll define the last but it, but it involves several pieces, comprehension and reading and making connections and transferring knowledge from one text to the other and, um, and really very complicated intellectual endeavors um, in what seems as a, what is a fun assignment. Uh, let me just complete, I'm sorry, let me just complete that. We use, uh, in our Portuguese classes, we use something that uh, you're probably familiar with, the can-do statements. So the students are really responsible for their learning. We establish the goals, and that really helps with assessment as well. So with the high school student project, I can add that because that is a is at the heart of the question that we struggle a lot with the school district. So the superintendent and I had a very frank discussion. Um, ideally, to provide the strongest empirical findings of an efficacy of a, a program is that we do randomized controlled trial. Right? That's a golden standard. But pretext is a paradigm that you can implement in classroom uh, that will even though we haven't seen quantitative effects in these students that we're going to work with yet, but we know it's not going to hurt them. And in this school district, they're ve they value art very much, arts and music. So the superintendent tells me that, OK, um, I, I love data too, but I think we cannot sacrifice um, uh, equity or accessibility to this program for the sake of science. I said, I agree with you. So what we plan to do um, is to uh, use one cohort of student, and we do it on-off pretext. So um, we do some measurements on the baseline, and then we have the pretest, um, uh, the pretext uh, implementation in teaching for a specific text for a period of time, and then we do some measurements, and then uh, we do another measurement as baseline the next semester, and we're not going to do pretext, and then we test them again. So that's one way to compromise the science in order to uh, give this cohort of students the accessibility to pretext. And so, of course, there are the golden standard of looking at students' attendance rate. Um, and in this particular sample, the dropout rate is as high as 50%. Which, and which is so not that high anymore. We hope that um, having this engagement, so we have the quantitative measure, and we'll also have some qualitative measure by uh, talking to the students uh, directly and also looking at how their family engage in the multicultural night and also communication with school. So uh, yeah, there is no best way to provide the best results and to measure uh, things like joy and um, creativity, <laughs> but we can do peripheral measure in order to uh, not interrupt um, the exposure and accessibility to these students. So hopefully we'll have some data soon. Mm -hmm. Yes. So my, my question is, uh, how critical is the text part of pretext? How critical is it? Yes. Like, could you could you use this method if you weren't reading a text? Sorry, I'm just going to um, restate that yes. for preservation purposes. So it's how critical is the text portion of pretexts? Yes. You you certainly could use uh, any communicative medium. Okay, one thing that I learned as a theorist of culture, literature specifically, is that 
any art can interpret any art. Okay, that, that, that's one kind of standard, um, <coughs> standard observation in art criticism. You can put a poem to music, you can uh, put music, you know, you can paint music, you can interpret any art by any art. Isn't that right? Okay, so what is the art that is most important to human development and that is the least popular? It's reading. I, I just asked our, our, uh, our friend economist James Robinson, Wendy's and my friend, you may know James Robinson, he worked here for uh, a while, he's now in Chicago. Uh, I said, you've read many more uh, studies of development than I. Tell me if there's any study you've ever seen that doesn't have literacy as an indicator. And he confirmed to me that there are none. Literacy is always an indicator of development. Economic development, social development, psychosocial, wh whatever it is, it's literacy. We are all literate. We know how to read and write. We can share that with people who are in need of, of, uh, of more uh, economic and social rights. And it's the least popular skill. If you ask a teenager to look at a picture, to listen to music, to, to, uh, to dance, to sing, they may want to go along with it. But if you say, read this difficult text, they're not going to. So even though pretext could start from a painting, could start from music, could start from anything, we make an arbitrary decision to start from a text and then go anywhere else we want because we need to get people to read and write at high levels. One of our uh, great facilitators is a young woman uh, who graduated from Harvard College um, two years ago. She's now doing a, um, a doctorate at Oxford. She's from Zimbabwe, and she did pretext in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe has a very high literacy rate, and so the mystery for investigators is why it has a high literacy rate and very low everything else rates, economic, political development rates. And her observation was that the kind of literacy that gets taught in Zimbabwe is rote. People sit in rows, you, you memorize cookie cutter answers, and so nobody thinks about it and nobody's interested in it. You know, they perform you know, what they need to perform, but nobody takes it, it's not theirs. It's, it's a real colonial education. So she came in with pretexts, turned the school around in one summer, and the, uh, the relationships between teachers and students and the principal and the text just uh, escalated to, to levels that nobody anticipated there. Um, so that's the kind of work we can be doing. Is this published anywhere, this, uh, her experience? Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. We, uh, do, do we have it on the website? The, the chapter that Nasima Mohammed and I did? Okay. Well, we should do it. Okay. Nasima Mohammed in Zimbabwe will get it on the website. Um, write us an email if you don't see it. Okay? If it's published. If, if uh, Nasima's work in Zimbabwe is published. Uh, yeah. We have um, a, a nice essay and we're, we're happy to uh, make it more public. Yeah. yeah, thank you for the pretext activities and tell, tell us yeah. about it. Tell, tell I enjoyed about it so much because it really involved a deep engagement with the text and we play with the text and our imaginations uh, go wild during these uh, activities. But one of my problem is because English is my foreign language, my second language. So and as far as my, ex my experience of teaching English is that um, learning new words are, are always the painful task for the students. So how can pretext activity engage with new words in this active? Yeah, thank you. We have uh, the experts uh, here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the, yeah, it's so true. I mean, and the people asked me, how do you get the students to, how do you get to use pretext? Because the students don't don't know the language, so they're going to be hearing the, you know, listening to the text, and we're going to do with that. So Doris was saying that for the most part we start with the text, but sometimes in foreign language I start with the visuals 
first. And we get to do activities with the visual, with the photos, sometimes music, and then we go to the, you know, listen to the text. Um, the, the drawing is also a great way of acquiring vocabulary. And then finally talking about what we did. Uh, that's when they are actually searching for the words and so on. So the visual is the, the, the great support we have for the foreign language. And the, here, here is the combination. The, the, the text that you choose for a class is critical. It has to be very, very well chosen because um, it has to be appropriate for the level, yet challenging. And then, um, of course, we, we always, uh, especially in the, in the lower levels, we start with the vocabulary. And then we do many activities like the, you, you know, the ones where you find the rhetorical uh, figures with vocabulary. And that, then students have to perform the vocabulary words that they have learned. And then they have to use them in a text. And then they have to draw them. And then they have to make sentences with them. And then uh, finally, we choose the, the word of the week. And it's uh, like, a, like a, everybody has to defend why this word is more important than other word uh, to, when we talk about the text. So it, it really becomes, you can do, I do, you know, there are units in which you can stress more vocabulary when it's more relevant, or when you want to add the, the, a very specific skill you know, the subjunctive after adverbial yeah. phrases. The, so you can do a lot. You can frame the creativity um, very nicely in, this, in the foreign language classroom with all those um, goals that are part of the skill, but that are really only there to frame the, the reading or the understanding of the text. Uh, I want to say along these lines um, something that I learned from a, um, a teacher of animated film in Bogota. Um, and I, 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 I've used this lesson in, in different ways. Um, he has a problem because he says, students who come to study with me know how to draw. They like technology. But we're talking about animated films. They don't know how to tell a story. They don't read. He's, so he says to them, how, how do you expect to, to do anything here if, uh, if you don't know how to tell a story? And they say, I don't know, right? So he, after he did training in pretext, he decided to canvas the, the class informally and, and ask them what books they hated in high school. Right? When teachers ask students what they like to read, that is such a losing question because they don't like to read. But if you ask them, what did you hate, they'll have something interesting to say. So what did they hate? All of the classics. All the classics. You know, first one was Don Quixote, the next one was La Celestina, El Cid, whatever, and La Vodagine. They didn't like La Vodagine either. Anyway, so he divided the class into four uh, teams with the four biggest losers. <laughs> and he um, got everybody to go after their text, their most hated text, right? So, you know, El Cid became a road rage uh, movie. And, um, you know, Don Quixote was about some crazy guy who kept, like a Mr. Magoo, kept falling all over himself, whatever. They made very funny movies out of these four classics, but each of the other teams had to consult for, um, for the other teams, right? So all four teams read four classics in one semester. <laughs> how, that, how clever was that? So I learned from him that you can ask um, a class, what, what word do you hate in this text? Right. Right? right. Like they're going to pick their hardest word. Right. Or what grammar construction do you despise? What keeps you up? What makes you anxious? <laughs> Right? right, like yeah. what's your target? And then you go after it, and then you make graffiti, of, you know. And, and graffiti is great because you can, you can have um, like strips of masking tape that don't do any damage anywhere, and you, you destroy a, a space with graffiti, you know, and then you 
pull it off after the class. But, but you know, you use attitude. You use anxiety and, and, and anger as part of the fuel. Why not? I mean, great artists use agita, right? I mean, they, 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 they use evil feelings. You know, we don't have to be nice all the time. <laughs> And there's a liberty in art making because you can you can be um, fueled by by whatever. It's not only pleasure. You know, it becomes pleasure because you you nailed that thing. You you got that word that you hated and you plastered it all over the place. <laughs> and then you scratched it out. But and you are you're the boss. And I remember the, there's also irreverence towards the canonical that can be very productive. And I remember. Um, one of our TFs who was very, he was a, a, a medievalist, and uh, he, he was teaching this section on El Cid, and students weren't reading. And he was besides himself. So I, 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 I suggested, I said, why don't you tell them to do a storyboard, like to put the, 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 you know, the, the epics of the Cid in a, in a storyboard format, or a graphic novel. So he tried it, and initially he was very offended that they, <laughs> <laughs> on the way that they represented El Cid. But then he, he, it was also a realization for him on how, how, how would El Cid look like now. I mean, he obviously wouldn't look like in the ninth century. So, so there, there, there was, uh, and the students wanted him to become this superhero. So there was a lot of negotiation, but again, he got them to read El Cid and to represent each scene in such accurate detail that he could not believe what, what, what he was getting. I, I, I want to say something about the storyboards and, and graphic novels because a great place to work is a museum or a gallery. You know, if we want our students to access the treasures that are here at Harvard and wherever we're working, right, take them to the Harvard Art Museum and say, uh, pick a gallery, one gallery, and make your storyboard, make your graphic novel, and, and cite the works that you're plagiarizing the way you would a book, right? Say, okay, I'm looking at this painting by Picasso done in, in this date, right? And, and you, you, you note it at the, at the bottom. But you are plagiarizing that image as part of your storyboard. And you're, you do, you're developing a familiarity and intimacy with that image that you wouldn't develop if you were just visiting the museum. So we, we can integrate lots of arts. And with the arts, we integrate different skill sets. And, um, and Adriana mentioned this. You, you know, the skill level is important. For example, how difficult is it for us as language and literature teachers to teach concepts like perspective? It's an important concept, but it's, it's abstract. But tell any, any student to pull out their, their cell phone and take four pictures of the same thing and see if they understand what perspective means. Or, or, or make them uh, do uh, songs out of a difficult text and see if they know what harmony and dissonance and, you know, and syncopation and all of those terms that we use for literature. See if they know what that means. So when we link one art form to another art form, we're increasing the skill set, the conceptual universe of students Without, um, without boring them. There's, a, there's no lecture here. There's trial and error. And somebody says, that's harmony. And somebody says, yeah, that's harmony. <laughs> that's not harmony. That's dissonance. Listen to you, you know? I mean, and they, they, they have these sophisticated arguments as fellow artists. Yeah. A logistical question, literally, about the, about the books. Are you putting these questions in the book? Are you writing? Are you rewriting the story? Are you? About, I don't know. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Are are the are the books? What what exactly is going in the books? Is this the questions you have? Is it just the outside piece on the inside? You I should guess, you should come look at the books. Okay. Um, this let's see, this book. 
uh, is called Five Fragments by Raul Zurita. Raul Zurita is probably the best living poet in the Spanish language. He was here uh, as a distinguished visitor for a while. Uh, so th this is, you know, this is work by Zurita. And it's, and it's in an edition that anybody can afford. Anybody who's tried to buy books in Latin America knows that they're very expensive, okay? This plagiarized edition, which he's delighted with, okay, because he he's, has a popular soul, uh, is Surita. Here are some um, folk tales from Kenya in Swahili and English. Okay, these were done by uh, public health workers in um, some eastern villages in Kenya as part of their development as public health workers because they have to know how to read and write well. And so their exercise for learning how to read and write well was to preserve local lore that otherwise get, gets forgotten in modern times. So you can do anything you want with these books. This, these are exercises around the letters by Schiller. And um, the students you know, were in a rush to get out, so they didn't take their writing. But, uh, but when, we, when we work with a difficult text, they make um, a cover. And uh, they fill it in with the text and, and with their, um, their speculations, and then their drawings. And, uh, you know, or or they, they steal somebody else's speculation because they like it better. <laughs> you know, it's, um, that, that's, that's one thing that we learn from recyclers, that everything that's good in literature, everything in literature, is recycled material, is plagiarized, is, you know, interpreted. <laughs> I like to remind people how Don Quixote starts. Do you remember how Don Quixote starts? It starts, I found this manuscript in a market. Mm -hmm. It was written by this Arab named Sidi Amete Berengeli. And I thought it was pretty good. I got it translated, and here it is. That's how it starts. And nobody ever thinks badly about Shakespeare because he didn't make up any stories, right? Everybody plagiarizes everybody. The question is with how much art, right? <laughs> and so that's, that's, why not invite young people into that freedom, that rigorous freedom of making art, and, and, and we can educate the world. I, I don't know if there are any more questions. Uh, I know we have another 10 minutes. I don't want to stop this. But, um, but please come, come see uh, some of these uh, tangents, some of the books. And uh, please stay in touch with us. And thank you so much again, Erin. <laughs>